Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Unit 2. This is the first lecture of the second unit of this course. We're going to shift gears completely now and talk more about how scientists learn more about DNA-related processes than the DNA-related processes themselves. So this is part one of a two-week lecture series, and here we'll be talking about polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. We'll talk about a bunch of different strategies for sequencing DNA, for determining the sequence of a DNA region, standard Sanger sequencing, which is often now referred to as first-generation sequencing, big dye sequencing, which is a derivative of Sanger, Illumina, or second-gen sequencing, and nanopore sequencing, or third-gen. We'll then talk about assays that we use in the lab to determine the position of nucleosomes as well. So for those of you that haven't heard of PCR before, PCR is probably one of the most uh, transformational experimental techniques to ever come across the molecular biology revolution. So much of what we do now in the lab with DNA is based on the technology of PCR. At its core, PCR is a DNA amplification technique. The analogy that's often used is that it's a Xerox machine for DNA, and that's a pretty good analogy. If you have just a handful of DNA sequences and you need billions of them, PCR can achieve that. So it's like DNA replication in a, in a tube. The classic definition of PCR is that it is a geometrically expanding, just means doubling with each cycle, amplification of specific DNA sequences. So if you start off with two DNA sequences, after one round or cycle of PCR, you'll go from two to four. And then you'll go 4 to 8, 8 to 16, 16 to 32. And as we'll see in a little bit, even with just doubling with each round, it really only takes about 28 or 30 cycles of PCR, and you can get on the order of tens of millions, if not billions of copies of your sequence. So the amazing power of PCR is that it allows for the amplification of any target sequence. And the limitation of PCR is that it allows for the amplification of any target sequence. So you can see a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek uh, thing there where it's the same exact sentence, but this is largely true. It is enormously powerful to be able to amplify a target sequence in the lab. The problem is that it has to be a target sequence. In other words, we need to know the sequence of the DNA region that we are going to amplify prior to amplifying it. We have to have sequenced that region, and that's why we talk about DNA sequencing in this lecture as well. So if we have a putative or hypothetical gene out there in a genome of an organism that hasn't been sequenced yet, we can't amplify that gene by PCR until we know that gene's sequence ahead of time. So in this lecture, we'll explore the process of PCR itself and the all-important PCR primers. We'll get to that in just a bit. So at its simplest consideration, this represents three cycles of a PCR reaction. We have an initial a template DNA, a target DNA region here in light blue all the way on the left. Uh, can't seem to see my pointer. Maybe it's being recorded by, uh, there we go. So here's the target sequence here on the left. After one round of PCR, that one target sequence has become two. Now in red here, these are the primers that have allowed the amplification to occur, and this darker strand is the new strand. So again, that idea of semi-conservative replication that we just touched on briefly in a prior lecture uh, each of these quote-unquote new molecules of DNA is actually made up of one old light blue strand and one newly synthesized darker blue strand. After the second round of PCR, that process repeats. So now we've gone from two molecules to four, and after the third round of PCR, we've gone from four to eight. Now what you can see is each time we make a new strand of DNA, we need a primer to accompany it. So these primers do actually prime the reaction. They kickstart the reaction off. Uh, and what we also have an uh, appreciation for is that we need some way to separate the strands with each round of PCR. So in order to go from one strand, one molecule of DNA to two, we had to pull these two light blue strands apart so that each could serve as a template. And then using the rules of base pairing and primers, a DNA polymerase could make a new strand using the old strand as a guide. So if there's a G right here, we would put a cytosine across from it. If there's a thymine here, we'd put an adenine across from it and so on. And then to go from these two molecules to these four, we have to again pull these strands apart so that they can be used as template and make new strands from them. And that's essentially all PCR is. Pulling DNA, double-stranded DNA apart, having primers come in and bind, and then going ahead and making new molecules of DNA with those uh, existing molecules as, as template. So separate strands, 
prime strands make new strands. Separate strands, prime strands make new strands. That's DNA uh, polymerase chain reaction in a nutshell. So how we pull those strands apart is with heat. If we heat DNA up to a sufficient temperature, essentially boiling, those two strands will denature. They'll melt away from each other. They'll separate into single strands. So the very first step of any cycle of PCR is heating the DNA sample up to near boiling, typically 95 to 98 degrees centigrade. And that causes that double-stranded DNA to become single-stranded. Now we cool that sample down. And by bringing the temperature down, this provides an opportunity for the primers to come in and base pair to our target sequence. So the primers are also using the rules of base pairing. If there's an adenine here, there's a thymine in the primer. If there's a guanine here, there's a cytosine in the primer. So these primers come down and bind to the target sequence. And now that these strands are primed, DNA polymerase can come and extend new DNA off of it. And DNA polymerase is going to use individual DNTPs as building blocks of DNA. That's DATP, deoxyadenosine triphosphate, DTTP, deoxythymine triphosphate, etc. And it's going to use that to uh, build a new strand of DNA. And then the process repeats. So now that we have two strands, two molecules of DNA, we heat those up. They separate into four single strands, cool them down so primers can come in, and DNA polymerase will make new DNA on those. So again, with each subsequent cycle of PCR, we double the copies of DNA from 4 to 8 to 16 to 32. And if we can get up to 30 cycles, we can get all the way to 2 billion copies, which is incredible. So PCR reactions are pretty straightforward. They don't need much. You start with a small, thin-walled PCR tube. This is like a very small microfuge tube that we see there in pink in the lower left. We add to that a polymerase chain reaction buffer. This buffer contains the correct pH, some salts, specifically magnesium or calcium, and we'll get to that in a challenge question. It also contains uh, the DNA polymerase itself, which is called TAC polymerase. The template DNA that we want to copy, that's our DNA sample in red, these primers that bind to the target sequence and prime or initiate replication, and there are our DNTPs, our nucleotides, our A's, T's, G's, and C's to serve as the building blocks of making new DNA. So this is what TAC polymerase looks like. A little bit of a word on TAC polymerase. The reason why we use TAC polymerase is because that TAC stands for the host organism that we've identified or isolated this polymerase from. That host organism's scientific name is Thermus aquaticus which translates in Latin to loving the heat, water organism that loves the heat. And indeed, that's what Thermus aquaticus is. It's a microorganism that lives in the thermal hot springs that we find in places like Yellowstone uh, and in other areas. So there are bacteria that grow at these near boiling temperatures. And those bacteria have obviously evolved as an extremophile to be able to withstand those high temperatures. And if they're growing and thriving in those thermal springs, then clearly DNA replication is occurring at those high temperatures because DNA replication is needed for cell division. And so the DNA polymerase of these organisms is heat stable. It can resist high heat. That's important because in PCR, we're cycling at some really high temperatures. A typical DNA polymerase from my cell or your cell or a yeast cell would denature and become non-functional at 98 degrees, that first step of PCR that we see right here. But TAC polymerase has no problem withstanding 98 degrees because it has evolved to exist in such high temperatures. So that's why we use TAC specifically to be uh, heat stable. And in fact, now most labs, including my own at Baypath, use FireTAC. Uh, FireTAC is a unique proprietary TAC made by a single company. It's patented. And it has this kind of trailing domain that you see in yellow here. And that trailing domain interacts with DNA non-specifically. It actually serves as a tether. So every single enzyme has what's called processivity or a uh, dissociation constant. These enzymes will let go of their target and then rebind. So typical DNA polymerase will make a few hundred or a few thousand new bases on a new growing strand of DNA, and then it'll fall off and have to reassociate, rebind to that DNA and continue. And this is just kind of the random Brownian motion of molecules in space. But because of this tether on fire tack, that DNA can't that DNA polymerase can't float off too far. It dissociates, but now it reassociates much more quickly and efficiently because it remains tethered to the DNA. So fire tack is much quicker and more efficient. Uh, it's more expensive too, but it's a really, really good enzyme. 
So those are the basics of PCR, just to kind of set the stage. And now I'm just going to let this video play, actually. Um, I think it's about a seven minute video, and, and this is the best video for understanding PCR. I'll also put this video in Moodle so that you have access to it and you can review it. But this video will kind of go over everything there is to know about how PCR works. A sample of chromosomal DNA, also called genomic DNA, can be used as the starting material for the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. With PCR, an investigator can amplify a single copy of a DNA segment into billions of identical copies. The DNA segment of interest, or target DNA, is indicated in red. In addition to the target DNA, a PCR reaction contains several other ingredients. These include free nucleotides, DNA primers, and the enzyme TAP polymerase. The primers are typically about 20 nucleotides long and are complementary in sequence to the ends of the target DNA. TAP polymerase is derived from hot springs bacteria and can tolerate the intense heat of a PCR reaction. A PCR reaction lasts several hours and typically consists of 20 to 35 repeating cycles. A cycle begins by heating the reaction mixture to 95 degrees Celsius. The heat denatures the DNA, breaking the hydrogen bonds that hold the strands together. After denaturing the DNA, the temperature is reduced to around 60 degrees so that the primers can form hydrogen bonds, or anneal, with their complementary sequences in the target DNA. Note that the primers and the target DNA follow base pairing rules. An adenine, A, pairs with a thymine, T, and a cytosine, C, pairs with a guanine, G. So I'm going to break in here for just a second and um, just highlight these primers. We've been alluding to them at the beginning. We're going to come back to primers and talk about them in some depth uh, in just a couple minutes as well. But I do want to point out that we've got two primers, right? We see this one here. This is what we would call the forward primer. It's binding to the top strand of the DNA, and it's going 5' prime to 3' prime inward. But there was also a reverse primer that bound to the other strand. We saw that one uh, just float down there before we zoomed into this region. We see that these primers are indeed complementary to the strands that they're binding to. So they're following the rules of base pairing. That's why we need to know the sequence of our target region before we can amplify it, so that we can design primers correctly. So we need to know the sequence of the DNA we're amplifying by PCR so we can design primers based on that sequence. And we're going to see in just a moment how these prime. Because DNA polymerase can only bind to double-stranded DNA, we have to first prime that region with this small double-stranded region that you see here. And DNA polymerase can land on that double-stranded region and then extend off this three prime end of this primer and start laying down new nucleotides based on the rest of the template strand sequence off of that primer. In the next phase, the temperature is raised to 72 degrees Celsius. TAP polymerase functions optimally at this temperature and begins polymerization, adding nucleotides to the three prime end of each primer attached to the DNA strand. After one complete cycle, there are two double-stranded copies of the target DNA. The PCR reaction mixture contains many copies of the primers and an abundant supply of nucleotides to perform many additional cycles. After a second cycle, there are four copies of the target DNA. After cycle three is finished, there are eight copies of the double-stranded target DNA sequence. Note that only two of the double-stranded copies consist of just the target fragment. The others also include flanking DNA regions. As the number of cycles increases, the products consist of a greater proportion of fragments with just the target DNA. After four cycles, half of the fragments consist of just target DNA, and half of the fragments also contain flanking DNA. With each additional cycle, the number of copies of our target sequence doubles. At the end of cycle 25, there are more than 33 million copies of this double-stranded target region. Pretty incredible, right? And so, again, you can see that we can quickly go from 35 million to 70 million. We get to a billion by about 30 cycles again.
So that's PCR in a nutshell. Again, you'll have access to this video in Moodle if you want to go back to it. Now, some experimental considerations around PCR. When we do a PCR reaction, we always include a no DNA control. In other words, we'll set up two identical parallel PCR reactions, and we will add the template DNA that we want to amplify to one of those tubes, and we'll add no DNA to the other. This is typically referred to as a negative control because it's designed to fail. We expect it to fail. There should be no DNA amplification in the no DNA control. If we do detect DNA amplification there, it means that we have contamination, contamination of DNA that we aren't trying to amplify. And DNA contamination is actually the primary cause of PCR failure. PCR is very, very sensitive because it amplifies at such a high degree. So we always do a no DNA control to make sure that we've gotten a DNA fragment amplified in our positive sample and the reaction has failed in our negative control. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about these primers and, uh, and then we can move on to DNA sequencing. So let's imagine this is the DNA region that we're trying to copy by PCR. And these dots in the middle, this just represents a lot more sequence in between. So this is the very beginning of the sequence we wish to amplify. This is the very end. And let's imagine there's a lot of intervening DNA in between. So we need primers. If we're going to have PCR work, we need to design primers against these sequences. And these primers need to bind to each strand, the top strand and the bottom strand, in such a way that the three prime end of the primer points inwards towards the region we wish to amplify. In other words, the three prime end of the top strand primer needs to bind so that its three prime end is pointing inward to the left, and the primer that binds to the bottom strand, binds it here on the right, needs to have its three prime end pointing inward towards the left. So we want to have this primer on this side point its three prime end towards the right, and this primer on this side point its three prime end to the left, as shown here. So let's put some five prime to three primes up here so we have some orientation. So those are the five prime to three prime strands uh, on the blue strands. When we separate those strands, of course, they're going to keep their same orientation. And then the primers have their own configuration. They're also going to be anti-parallel to the strands they're binding to. So on the bottom strand, we see that in order to have the three prime end pointing towards the right, which we already said is a requirement, we have to have this primer bind five prime to three prime to the bottom strand. And in order to have this three prime end here pointing towards the left, this has to be binding five prime to three prime anti-parallel to the top strand. So that restricts where these primers can physically bind. They need to be anti-parallel to the template strand they're binding to, and they have to have their three prime ends pointing inwards towards the sequence to be amplified. And they have to be complementary. So the first primer, primer number one over here, this is our forward primer. It's going five prime to three prime left to right, just as we expect DNA to go. It's going in that forward direction, five prime to three prime left to right. Primer number two is our reverse primer. It's going five prime to three prime right to left. It's going in reverse of how we typically read words in the English language at least. So five to three right to left is the reverse primer. If we take a closer look, we can see that we also have some sequence cues here when it comes time to design this primer. Typically, when we're given the sequence of any DNA region, we're really only given the sequence of the top strand, as we see here. That's because it's redundant to show the bottom strand. The bottom strand, of course, we know or we can infer because it's complementary to the top strand. So this would be the sequence that we're given for the region that we want to amplify. Like if we were to look it up on a website, this would be what we're looking at, the top strand sequence. And if we look closely, we see that the sequence of the forward primer exactly matches the top strand sequence. This is C-A-G-A-T-C-C, C-A-G-A-T-C-C. Because both the top strand and the primer are complementary and anti-parallel to the bottom strand, so of course their sequences will match. That means designing the forward primer is easy. We just find a region that fits all of our criteria for primer design. We find that region in the sequence that we are given by the website, and we just pull a primer off that sequence. Hey, this is a great place for a primer to bind. Let me order the primer C-A-G-A-T-C-C-A-T-G-G-A-T-G. It's going to match exactly. The reverse primer is a little bit more complicated. Because the reverse primer obviously doesn't match the sequence we're looking at. In this region, I see CTAGTCCTAT. The primer I need to order 
is T-C-A-T-A-G-G-A-T. And remember, we always read DNA 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So I'm reading this primer sequence backwards, or I'm reading it right to left, because that's its 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So we're given this sequence by the website, and we need to order this primer. That means we need to determine the reverse complement sequence. What do I mean by reverse complement? I mean we need to find the region that we want to design the primer to, like this region right here, starting with this C and ending with this A. We need to determine the complementary sequence, G, A, T, C, A, G, G, A, T, A, C, T. And then we need to reverse that complement. We need to order that sequence, but in the opposite direction, T, C, A, T, A, G, G, A, C, T, A, G. Then we can order that primer because it's the reverse complement. It's in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, right to left. So we've designed our primers. We've ordered our primers. We have our template DNA. We throw the primers, the template DNA, in a tube with reaction mix, with TAC polymerase, with DNTPs. We cycle it 30 times, high temperature to melt the two strands, lower temperature for primer anneal, final temperature for primer extension or TAC polymerase activation. And now what do we do? How do we determine whether or not this worked? Well, what we have to do is primarily run a gel, do gel electrophoresis. We can do this with agros from seaweed, which kind of makes like a jello gel. We can do this with acrylamide, uh, more of a chemical approach, a, a compound that's made artificially. But what we do is we put our DNA in these hollow vacant voids in the gel. So imagine this blue gel here, this, this rectangular gel, is a three-dimensional slab of essentially jello, firm jello that doesn't jiggle. So we can create these voids or these wells in that mold of gel and put our DNA samples, our liquid DNA samples, in those molds, in those wells. And then we apply an electrical current. We're going to put a positive charge at the bottom of the gel and a negative charge at the top of the gel, and the gel is going to be submerged in a solution that conducts electricity. So really what we've done is we've created a circuit or a wire where the gel itself is the wire. Electrons are going to flow through the gel because of this current. They're going to flow from the negative electrode to the positive electrode. But as we know, DNA is also negative. So not only are the electrons going to flow through the gel, the DNA is going to flow through the gel as well. The DNA is also going to move towards the positive electrode because it's negatively charged. However, the gel itself is going to impede that DNA's migration. So the DNA is going to separate based on size as it moves through the gel. The smallest fragments of DNA are able to navigate the barrier of the gel more easily and more efficiently because they're more flexible, they're smaller, and so smaller fragments are going to travel through the gel at a faster rate. The larger a DNA fragment is, the slower it will move through the gel. So starting at the top, at the wells, we'll have a separation of DNA fragments based on their size, where the smallest size fragments are near the bottom of the gel. And as fragments are larger and larger, they'll come to closer and closer to the wells, closer and closer to the top of the gel. This is called size fractionation. Additionally, we diffuse the gel with a compound usually called ethidium bromide, which binds preferentially only to DNA and illuminates or fluoresces orange under UV light. So as the DNA moves through the gel, it picks up this ethidium bromide dye. The DNA itself becomes stained with ethidium bromide, and then we can move our gel to a UV light box, uh, this kind of rectangle that we can put the gel on that has UV bulbs under it, and we can illuminate the gel with UV light, and our DNA will fluoresce orange due to the ethidium bromide that it has accumulated. So we can see our bands of DNA in the gel itself. And then finally, we often run what's called a molecular weight ladder on our gels, and this contains fragments of DNA of known size. We purchased this from a vendor. So we've got bands or fragments of DNA in one lane. They were loaded in one well of this gel, creating a lane. And now, based on the sizes of these molecular weight ladder bands, we can infer the size of our sample bands. So for example, this band here is probably about 140 or 150 base pairs in length. And I know that because 100 base pairs of DNA runs down here. So this is certainly bigger in length than that. 
Remember, the bigger you are, the higher up in the gel you are. This is where 200 base pairs runs, and we're lower than that. If we were exactly halfway between 1 and 200, we would say that this band was 150 base pairs long, but we're a little bit lower than halfway between, so I'll say about 140, 145. Uh, taking the same approach, we would estimate that this band is, well, what would you say? What would be the size of that DNA fragment in that band, do you think? I would guess about 380 base pairs, more or less, maybe 385, right? We're a lot bigger than 300 and a little bit smaller than 400. And to be clear, we could create a standard curve. We could actually measure the distances of each of these bands in the gel in centimeters and plot that on a graph along with the size of the bands on the other axis. And we can generate a standard curve and truly precisely map the distances of each of these bands and determine their length. We could do that, but oftentimes we just eyeball it. And then finally, the intensity of the glowing is a representation of the mass of the DNA. So the more DNA that's loaded in a band in a, in a well, the brighter that band will glow. So we can get a lot of information from these gels. If we were running our PCR fragment, our PCR product, and we saw one band of the right size, right, corresponding to the size of the sequence we were trying to amplify, we see that band in our sample and we do not see that band in our no DNA control, then we would know that we had success. We would know that we amplified our sequence correctly. So that's PCR. Now we'll go on and talk about DNA sequencing in all three forms, first gen, second gen, and third gen. There are lots of reasons we have for sequencing DNA. We sequence DNA to learn about its function uh, in order to deduce the amino acid sequence that it encodes. Remember, with the genetic code, we can infer from a start code onto a stop code on all of the amino acids that are going to be decoded by translation. We sequence DNA in order to have that sequence in hand so we can design primers for PCR. Oftentimes we sequence DNA medically in order to determine the presence of mutations. There's lots of different ways to sequence DNA as well. The earliest, one of the earliest, is called Sanger sequencing, named after Fred Sanger, the gentleman who, uh, who invented it, actually a winner of two distinct Nobel Prizes. And then Sanger sequencing has been derived to more modern approaches, but they're still based on Sanger's chemistry. Uh, big dye sequencing, shotgun sequencing are examples. And then we have second gen sequencing, which is a completely different chemistry. It's actually based on uh, the release of photons of light. And third gen sequencing, which still sounds like science fiction to me, is actually the pulling of single strands of DNA through a very thin tube and measuring electrical current. So we're going to talk about all of these in the next few minutes. All of these techniques at this point can rapidly sequence DNA. The first step of determining the purpose of any gene is to sequence that gene. And by knowing that sequence of bases that comprises the gene, we can at least begin to guess at its function based on the amino acids that it codes for. DNA sequencing technology was invented at first in the late 70s, and it's only been improved in the last five decades. Uh, it's, again, been brought to a point that is almost like science fiction. Even though it's been changed and improved and derived, uh, basically at the core of all of it is DNA replication, and that's how sequencing is primarily done, except for third gen. The most widely used sequencing strategy still is Sanger sequencing, and it relies on a single molecule called the di-deoxynucleotide, uh, or it's di-deoxy-DNA sequencing. This occurs in a tube in vitro, and it allows for a collection of DNA fragments of all different sizes to be made, and each of those DNA fragments terminates at a different individual base, giving us the ability to determine the, the identity of each of those bases and infer the sequence. So we go from a very, very small fragment that ends in a G to a very, very large fragment that ends in a G as well. But by knowing the identity of the terminating base in each of these fragments, we can infer that the sequence of this strand is G, C, T, A, C, T, A, G, G, C, A, 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 T, G. Each of these fragments ends in the next base. If we know the identity of that base, we can determine the sequence. And as we just talked about geoelectrophoresis, that's actually how we separate these fragments based on size, by a size fractionation technique. So let's bring all the chemistry together. To do Sanger sequencing, you would set up four different tubes for four different parallel reactions. Each tube would get an identical amount of the DNA template you wish to determine the sequence of. And each would get a primer that can initiate replication at that sequence.
Each tube gets DNA polymerase, so that extension can occur. Each tube gets DNTP. So, sounds a lot like PCR, right? Remember, I told you PCR is at the heart of most everything we do in molecular biology. So this sounds like we're just going to copy DNA, and that's largely true. But remember, we have four of these reactions being run in parallel. Now, here's where each of those four tubes gets different. Each of those individual tubes is going to get its own unique, different dideoxynucleotide. One will get dideoxyadenine, one dideoxythymine, one dideoxyguanine, and the other dideoxycytosine. And this is what the dideoxynucleotide looks like. It's a standard nucleotide. It's got its three phosphates here coming off the five prime carbon. Here's the ribose sugar. We've got the base coming off the one prime carbon. But most DNA, all DNA, would have a hydroxyl group here at the three prime carbon. Remember, when we talked about the difference between DNA and RNA, we said RNA has two hydroxyl groups one at the two prime carbon and one at the three prime carbon. DNA is supposed to have one hydroxyl group. The reason why DNA is deoxy ribonucleic acid is because it lost the oxygen on the two prime carbon. It only has one hydroxyl group. Well, these nucleotides that we're talking about now are called dideoxy. They've been deoxified twice. They're missing both of those oxygens, and these are terminating nucleotides. The way that we link one nucleotide to another when we're extending DNA is through that hydroxyl group. We need that three prime hydroxyl group in order to join the next nucleotide onto the growing chain of DNA. Since we don't have that hydroxyl group, this DNA molecule, this nucleotide, will be terminating. It will be a dead end for DNA replication. Once these DDNTPs, these dideoxynucleotides, are incorporated into a growing strand of DNA, DNA synthesis stops for that strand. So in that tube that has DD adenine triphosphate, new DNA will be made, everything's going along just like a normal PCR reaction, make a new DNA, make a new DNA, extending the strand, extending the strand, and then one of those DD ATPs is incorporated, and that fragment stops at that point. So here we see that that occurred at this position. There was a thymine on the template strand, a DD ATP went into place, and that's a dead end for this strand. Now we might ask, why didn't we terminate at this A or at this A? Remember, every one of these reactions also has DNTPs, typical nucleotides. So we don't only put uh, terminating nucleotides in place. We just have this competition between terminating nucleotides and the normal ones. So some other strands in that tube have terminated at these other A's. And they're represented as their own bands, their own fragments of DNA. But this particular fragment terminated here. So we've got a DNA strand of a set size, right? This one is 3, 6, 9, 10 bases long that ends in an A. We know it ends in an A because this is the tube that contains DDATPs. And because there are so many of those DDATPs around, so many DNTPs around, so much template, so much primer, and so much polymerase, this is occurring at every conceivable adenine that we have on this molecule. So we get termination at all of these, and we get fragments of DNA representing termination at all the A's. So the end result in this tube is a series of DNA fragments of different sizes that all end at A, and all of those different A-terminating fragments will run at a different place in a gel based on their size. So for example, for this one, we would get three bands. This band, this band, and this band. The band we see here corresponds to the DNA that terminated at this adenine. How do I know that? Well, I know that because if we terminate at this adenine, we would be, we would have the smallest fragment of DNA possible, and this band ran the fastest in the gel. That means this band corresponds to the intermediate A, and this high band ran the slowest. That's the longest fragment that ended in this adenine. So we get these three bands, these three adenines, terminating here. Remember, I told you we set up four tubes, and each tube got a different DNTP. So that means the same exact thing that happened in that tube for the A's is happening in the T tube for the T's. We're terminating at all of the T's, and we get bands representing all that termination. And it's happening in a C tube, where the DDCTP is. Now we're terminating at all the C's, and finally it's happening in the DDGTP tube as well. So this is a typical sequencing gel. The very, very first base, the very first base of the region we're trying to sequence is represented by the smallest band on the gel. 
So I find that band by looking at the bottom of the gel. It's this band here, and I know what base that is because it's in the A terminating lane. So that means the very, very first base of this sequence is an adenine, an A. And then it's a thymine, right? After that A, we have a thymine. So thymine is the next one. Here's our thymine. It's in the T lane, it's the next biggest band. And then it's a guanine, and then it's a thymine, and then it's a cytosine and an adenine. So by using this sequencing gel, by measuring it from the bottom up, I would determine the sequence to be A, I need my pointer again, A, T, G, T, C, A, G, T, C, C, A, G. That's the sequence I've determined experimentally. And if I peel back the curtain and I look at the sequence that I'm trying to determine, I see that it is A, T, G, T, C, A, G, T, C, C, A, exactly what we determine it to be uh, by the gel. So we're always reading these bands from the bottom up, from the smallest band to the highest, and we know the identity of each base based on the lane that it is in. So that's Sanger sequencing. Pretty interesting, right? Pretty, pretty amazing to have devised this as a chemist, but, uh, but this served as the basis of sequencing for a very, very long time. At this point, we've got kits for Sanger sequencing that are completely automated and done uh, robotically. So instead of labeling the primer and having four different tubes the way we've described it here, now what we do is we actually label the actual terminating nucleotide with a fluorophore, so it fluoresces, and we give each terminating nucleotide a different color. So we're still generating a series of bands. We're still generating a series of DNA fragments of different sizes, and the sizes are dictated by where the termination occurred. And the termination is occurring at every single base, but now the terminating nucleotides, the DDNTPs, are each fluorescently labeled. So we can tell them apart based on their color. Therefore, we don't have to separate them into four tubes. We can do it all in one tube, because if I see a very, very short blue gl gl glowing band, I know that's the first base, and that's a guanine, because guanine is what fluoresces blue. The next biggest band is green, and I know that's a cytosine because cytosine fluoresces green. So we discriminate between the bases based on the color that they fluoresce. And once again, the size of the band still tells us the order of the bases. So all of this is done robotically with the instrument detecting or sensing the color as the DNA fragments run through. And this is a typical output of a sequencing reaction of this kind. Each of these peaks represents the brightest color that the instrument saw at that point. The peak closest to the left is the smallest. The peak closest to the right is the largest. The instrument is calibrated to know what each fluorophore corresponds with as a base. So the instrument spits out the sequence for you in a very automated way. A very, very nice process. This is called big dye sequencing because it, it relies on these large fluorescent dyes. But we now have even faster techniques that allow us to sequence a genome in hours instead of years. That leads us to second-gen sequencing. There's a story that goes along with second-gen sequencing. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's the story that I was told in grad school. So the story is that there was a molecular biologist who was a new father, and his child was born with a genetic disorder that uh, was not diagnosable. Doctors didn't know what this kid had. And it had some cognitive effects, and the parents were beside themselves with worry. And being a molecular biologist, the scientist figured, like, I need to figure out what's wrong with my new baby. Science can't tell me yet what's wrong. Medicine is kind of failing me because they're in the dark. I need to get this kid's genome sequenced. I need to sequence my son's entire genome in order to determine where those mutations might be. The problem was that at that point, even though the human genome had been sequenced, it had taken over a decade to do so. The technology wasn't fast enough. Sanger sequencing uh, can only be done in fits and starts. It's not very good at high throughput rapid sequencing. So he took a sabbatical, he locked himself in the attic, and he basically devised and invented a brand new rapid sequencing technique, and that's Illumina sequencing, that's second gen sequencing. So again, I can't vouch for the veracity of that story, but that's the story that I was told. So here's how second gen sequencing works. Basic reaction for a DNA uh, amplification is that you have some DNA strand of some number of nucleotides. So DNA N just means we have N number of nucleotides on this DNA and we want to add one more nucleotide. So we're going to take this DNTP and we're going to add it. That gives us a new DNA strand of N plus one because we just added that nucleotide. And we have as a byproduct uh, inorganic pyrophosphate, PPI. And that's because of this chemistry.
Here's the nucleotide that we want to add to the growing chain, right? It's got its three phosphates, its ribosugar, and its base. We add this nucleotide onto the growing strand through this alpha phosphate, this first phosphate. So we're going to cleave that bond right there and release those two phosphates as a waste product. That's your PPI. That's your pyrophosphate. So what this technique leverages is the fact that if PPI is present, the only way PPI is present is if a nucleotide was just added to the growing strand of DNA. In other words, if this bond here was broken so that this nucleotide could be added to that strand. So the presence of PPI is an indicator that a nucleotide was just added to DNA. So what this process does, what this instrument does, is it squirts on to the reaction one specific nucleotide, let's say DATP, and it waits. It waits for the presence of PPI. If PPI is indicated, then one of those A's was just added, and we know the next base was an A. However, if on the template strand there's a guanine, nothing's going to happen with that adenine added. We're not going to get any release of PPI because what needs to go across from a guanine is a cytosine. So the instrument waits for a bit. If there's no indication of PPI release, it's going to flush that A away. Now it's going to squirt on thymine. Still nothing, right? Because thymine doesn't pay pair with guanine, and so we're not going to have any release of PPI there. That flushes the thymine away. Then squirts on cytosine. Oh, now PPI will be released because that cytosine will go across from the guanine due to base pairing. In order to add that nucleotide in place, we're going to cleave off that PPI. We're going to add that nucleotide onto the growing strand, and that PPI can be detected. And the instrument knows that the very next base on the sequence was that cytosine. So how is the instrument detecting PPI release? It's detecting it by light. Using two additional coupled reactions, light is emitted every time PPI is released. So when PPI is released due to DNA synthesis, that PPI couples with a cofactor called APS, and this is an uh, enzyme catalyzed by sulfurase, and the end product of that is going to be ATP. So ATP is now made. And that ATP is going to be used by an enzyme called luciferase to power a light-emitting reaction. Luciferase is actually the enzyme made by fireflies, allowing them to light up at night. So all they need is energy and then this luciferin compound, and light can be released. So if light is released, that means ATP was around. Well, ATP was around because PPI was around, and PPI was around because the nucleotide was just added to the growing strand of DNA. So again, to go from the beginning... If there's a guanine in that template strand and cytosine needs to be added next, you squirt on adenine, you're not going to see any light because adenine doesn't cause the release of PPI. But if you squirt on cytosine, that cytosine is going to base pair with the guanine. DNA polymerase is going to cleave that phosphate so that that new cytosine can be added to the growing strand and that's going to release PPI as a byproduct. That PPI is going to be gobbled up by APAs and converted into ATP. And that ATP is going to power this light reaction of luciferase and result in light being released. When the instrument sees a puff of light released, it's going to know that that uh, nucleotide was just added, and it will know that cytosine was the next base because cytosine is what it just squirted into the reaction. So that's second gen. Third gen is even faster. Third gen is the only sequencing technology that doesn't rely on DNA replication at all. No DNA polymerase, no addition of new bases. In third generation sequencing, we have this nanopore. This is almost like a channel that you would find in the membrane, but it's artificially created. And there's a voltage applied across this channel. So voltage is the, a potential energy of electricity. Uh, there is the possibility for current to flow, but current doesn't necessarily flow across that, that voltage. Each individual base, each individual nucleotide has its own unique conductivity, its own unique current that it will allow to pass. So adenine has a high current, cytosine a little bit of a lower current, guanine a lower current still, and then thymine gives an intermediate current, but each base has its own unique current that it will allow to flow across this nanotube. So how this works is that double-stranded DNA is separated into single strands, and one of those two strands is pulled through this nanopore, base by base, nucleotide by nucleotide. That voltage potential is always across the nanopore, but the current that is measured flowing across the nanopore is a function of the base that's in the pore at that moment. 
So right now, at this very moment, as we've captured this, we see that the current flowing through the nanotube is this intermediate current. And the instrument knows that that specific current means it must be a cytosine in the pore at this moment. Cytosine is the next base. The very next current that would be detected is going to be a high current. As this adenine gets into the center of the pore, electricity is going to flow across the adenine at a different current, a high current, and the instrument's going to detect that current next and say, oh, I know what that current signature is. That's adenine. Adenine must be next. So we pull the DNA through the nanopore, base by base, one base at a time, measuring the different currents that cross the nanopore with each base, and the amount of that current gives us the base's identity. Absolutely amazing. Amazing that we can make this nanopore. Amazing that we know that DNA molecules have different conductivities. Amazing that we can detect these microcurrents. This whole thing, like I said, is, is science fiction to me. So here's kind of a timeline of DNA sequencing. Uh, again, Sanger sequencing is somewhere in this realm here, this, this manual gel-based sequencing. And then we were able to automate that with big dye sequencing. Big dye sequencing came up right at the end of the previous century, uh, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. So it's still Sanger-based, but it's just automated. And then we get to things like Illumina sequencing and the nanopore sequencing, second gen and third gen, etc. And you can see that with each iteration of innovation, the speed of our sequencing increases by orders of magnitude. So again, it took over a decade to sequence the human genome in the late 90s and early 2000s, and now it takes about two hours to sequence a human genome. You can spit in a tube that you buy at CVS and mail it away to a company, and they'll have your particular genome sequenced for you within a few weeks. And the time lag is only because of their backlog, not because of the reaction. So pretty incredible. So that's DNA sequencing. Now, to wrap up, we're going to talk about nucleosome positioning assays. So to integrate some thinking here, let's think back. Remember, this is unit one material, nucleosomes. We talked about nucleosomes, DNA being wrapped around nucleosomes for condensation. We talked about HDACs, locking nucleosomes in place, HATs, loosening nucleosomes, chromatin remodelers like switch sniff, pushing nucleosomes to adjacent sequences with the energy of ATP. So we have this information in our back pocket. Wouldn't it be nice as experimentalists to be able to map nucleosome positions from living cells and identify genes where nucleosomes are being used uh, for repression, for example, uh, where they're being intentionally placed for cellular processes rather than just randomly placed? It'd be nice to be able to detect a strategically placed nucleosome being used to turn a gene off, for example. So we can do that. We can position or we can detect the positions of nucleosomes in the lab experimentally. And we do this by leveraging a specific DNA enzyme, DNA cutting enzyme called micrococcal nuclease or eminase. Micrococcal nuclease can cut naked DNA that is nucleosome free, but at relatively low concentrations of the enzyme, it is blocked from cutting DNA that's wrapped in a nucleosome. So DNA wrapped in a nucleosome is protected from eminase cleavage or cutting and DNA, linker DNA, between nucleosomes is readily cut by eminase. So by using this enzyme and then running a gel and visualizing the bands yielded by eminase digestion, we can infer the position of nucleosomes and experimentally answer questions such as, are these nucleosomes placed intentionally? Are they involved in repression? So here's how it works schematically. Let's imagine that we have a nucleosomal array such that we see here. And here's a region of nucleosome-free DNA. This is so that an enhancer is exposed. Remember, we have transcription factors that bind to enhancers. Those are the transcription factors that then talk to mediator for combinatorial control. So we can treat these samples with micrococcal nuclease. Micrococcal nuclease will always cut between these uh, nucleosomes. And it will liberate these protected regions of DNA that were between nucleosomes. And then again... We would run that DNA on a gel to size fractionate it, small bands, small fragments running to the bottom of the gel, large fragments staying near the top. And then we would do something called a southern blot. We would take the DNA from that three-dimensional gel and we would transfer it, keeping that migration pattern, we would transfer it to a two-dimensional sheet or filter, a specific um, chemical. Uh, I'm not even saying it right. It's like a piece of paper, but it's not paper. It's a specific compound that DNA adheres to. 
It's like fly paper for DNA, sticky for DNA. So the DNA is going to imprint on this membrane, on this filter paper, in the exact same size fractionated pattern that it was in the gel. So it remains size fractionated. And then by using some molecular biology ticks, tricks, namely a probe, a visual piece of DNA that will base pair to our target sequence, we can visualize the bands that we're interested in. So again, we have our genomic DNA, we cut it with microcockal nuclease, so now we've cleaved between all nucleosomes, but not the DNA within nucleosomes. We run all that DNA on a gel so it separates based on size, we transfer that DNA onto a membrane, we probe the membrane with a visible piece of DNA that's going to specifically base pair only to the target DNA we're interested in seeing, and then we'll do the visualization, and we get something like this. So this is a standard microcockle uh, nucleosome positioning assay for just ordered arrays of nucleosomes. So here's where nucleosome 1 exists. It exists right between these two bands. So microcockle nuclease cut the linker DNA here and the linker DNA here. And then we've got another protected region where the second nucleosome lies and microcockle nuclease cut at the next linker region. Third nucleosome is here, fourth nucleosome is there. Beautiful. But we can also get at functionality. So here in this assay, same kind of idea. We've got wild-type cells here. Wild-type cells are showing that microcockle nucleus is cutting here. That means there's a nucleosome positioned here that's protecting. Microcockle nucleus is cutting here. There's a nucleosome here that's protecting. Microcockle nucleus is cutting here. There's a nucleosome here that's protecting, and up we go. Now, if we cut pure naked DNA, we see that if there are no nucleosomes around, Microcockle nuclease loves to cut in this region. So there is a nucleosome here protecting MNase cleavage because otherwise MNase would cleave. And microcockle nuclease loves cutting in this region too. But we can't cut there in a wild type cell because there's a nucleosome protecting it. Now what if we were to delete our old friend TUP1, our repressor protein? What happens is the cleavage pattern of microcockle nuclease matches what we see in naked DNA. In other words, that nucleosome that was present here in the wild type cell, that nucleosome is now absent when we delete TUP1. That means TUP1 is involved in positioning that nucleosome. Well, what recruits TUP1 to the DNA? Well, at A and B1, TUP1 is recruited by ROX1. So what if we delete ROX1? If we delete ROX1, there it is again. We're getting cleavage in that protected region. So ROX1 recruits TUP1, and TUP1 recruits a nucleosome. And that nucleosome recruited by TUP1 is protecting from microcockle nuclease cleavage here. So now the glaring question is, well, where is that nucleosome? Can we map the position of this particular nucleosome to the A and B1 gene? And in fact, we can. That nucleosome is landing and mapping right here. This is the region of the A and B1 promoter that's being protected by that TUP1 position nucleosome. And look what that region includes, the A and B1 Tata box. So indeed, ROX1 binds to DNA, it recruits TUP1, TUP1 recruits a nucleosome, which intentionally wraps the Tata box of A and B1, and once the Tata box of A and B1 is wrapped, TBP and TF2D can no longer bind to it, and that gene can no longer be transcribed. So the way that TUP1 is repressing A and B1 is by nucleosome positioning. Uh, I'm slightly ashamed uh, at the shameless plug, but this is my own work. This was one of my discoveries as a doctoral student. So this is from my paper. And in fact, this is a paper um, that you'll be reading this week. If you haven't read it already, this is the paper that you'll be reading this week. So you've got the background on the ROX1 TUP1 story from the previous lecture before the exam. And now we've delved a little bit into at least some of the data from the paper here so that you have some background bringing together a lot of things, right? We've talked in this lecture about enhancers, bringing us back to combinatorial control. We're talking about nucleosomes, bringing us back to DNA compaction. We're talking about transcription regulation. So a lot of very, very rich topics here uh, that we are able to discuss using unit one as our foundation. So to summarize what we did talk about here, we started off talking about PCR, this geometrically expanding amplification of DNA, doubling with each cycle, uh, mimics DNA replication in a tube, and we talked quite a bit about all of the components of PCR, but most specifically primers. Primers are required to kickstart DNA replication by any DNA polymerase, and we have to design these primers specifically based on the sequence we wish to amplify.
We then moved on to sequencing. We started off with Sanger sequencing, which relies on dideoxy DNTPs or dideoxy nucleotides. Like PCR, it's DNA replication in a tube, but these DDNTPs are terminating. Once they are incorporated, DNA synthesis stops, and that allows us to deduce the sequence of our DNA region uh, because of the different fragments that are generated that we can see on a gel. Second gen sequencing, that Illumina sequencing, relies on two coupled reactions. When pyrophosphate, PPI, is released due to DNA incorporation, uh, a nucleotide joining a growing strand, that PPI is detected because it's used with APS to make ATP, and that ATP is used to generate light, and the instrument detects the light. So light means PPI was generated, PPI means that a nucleotide was just added to the strand, and we can sequence in real time as replication occurs. And finally, third gen requires no DNA replication at all. It pulls a single strand of DNA through a voltage nanopore, and by measuring the conductivity of each base as it passes through that pore, we can determine the sequence of the DNA by measuring those conductivities. And we added with nucleosome positioning assays, by using nuclease, we can cut between nucleosomes, leaving the DNA wrapped within nucleosomes protected, and we can map nucleosome positions along the DNA by looking at the pattern of nuclease cleavage and protection. Good, good stuff. Um, we're talking about things here that I've done hundreds, if not thousands of times in the lab over my professional career. Uh, hopefully some of you are engaged in research or will have the opportunity to be engaged in research and you'll have the joy that comes and the satisfaction that comes with employing these techniques in the lab as well. So until next time, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you all in class on Friday.